Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's stand together as we open our service in song. Only you are worthy, God, 
God, let your fire fall down. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. Let every heart adore, let every soul awake. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this Let us pray. Our gracious God and Father, we come before you today. Another week has passed, filled with uncertainty for many, a week of anxiety, of concern, especially as we look ahead to the future, the coming week, the coming months. We ask many questions. When will the schools reopen? Will they be virtual? Will they be real in classroom? What about those who have been furloughed? Will they be given an opportunity to return to work? There are so many things that are happening now that fill us with uncertainty and rightfully with concern. 
And so we're reminded of the words of Job, who tells us that life is full of trouble. And with this pandemic, it has become very clear that many things that we have trusted in, the institutions, the foundations, have begun to crack, to crumble. Others will be transformed. There will be progress as a result of this close down. Companies are reconsidering how to do business. Families are reconsidering how to conduct education. School systems are looking at virtual versus classrooms. And in the midst of all of this, we're simply reminded that there is one foundation that is true, that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that is the foundation of faith, faith in the living God, that all that we see is not haphazard, that all we see is not determined simply by the will of men and women, but behind all things in some great mystery is the alchemy that you have created, that you as our God have a plan, that that plan is functioning perfectly, that you cause each generation to look closely at who is God? What type of God is he? Is he a God who is constantly surprised? Is he a God who is withdrawn? Is he a God who has turned his back? Is he a God who is full of superstition? Is he a God who is punishing? Well, none of those are the God that we are speaking to now. For you, God, are the one and only God. All of these others are simply figments of our imagination. Without your word, we would not know anything about you. We would be left to pagan superstition. And so we come today thankful that you are a God who has a plan. You are executing that plan. You're continually calling people to decide about your involvement in their life, and especially what to do with our guilt and our shame, that Jesus Christ came into this world to die on a cross, that we might be forgiven, that we might be redeemed. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of worship. We ask for your blessing upon this time of service. In Jesus' name, amen. It's during this time that we would uh, be taking the offering. You're just reminded of the two offering boxes uh, as you leave the service. Also, at the conclusion of today's service, there will be a very brief uh, congregational meeting. Uh, we will be receiving uh, ballots, as you've been informed over the last uh, two months of elders and the process that we've gone through. Uh, if you would just stay just a minute or two uh, so that we can uh, bring that process to conclusion. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you that we can trust you even in days of uncertainty, in plans that are unclear, in the midst of all this, there is a foundation that is far deeper and stronger and firmer. Your word, your son, and faith. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Yesterday, I was over at Point Pleasant and walking on the boardwalk. I, I love to take that walk. It was a beautiful day. Uh, the crowds uh, were there. Everything's open. Uh, there were people going up and down the boardwalk. And 
I have my ear tuned uh, just to pick up those little random pieces of conversation that people have between each other. There were several things that I heard that reminded me of really the foundation upon which you and I have been blessed uh, to live. There was a circle of flags on the beach, maybe a hundred, maybe two hundred, it was so many. And inside, a family was having a reunion. And uh, there was the parents and kids and aunts and uncles. And as I, I just noticed it from the side of my eye, uh, a young couple of guys passed me by. One guy said, you know, my father would have done something like that. And it struck me how many in this generation would do something like that. Another couple passed me. One of them said to the other, I think that's in the Bible. And that's all I heard. A couple of minutes later, another group passed me, and they were deep in some type of conversation. And one of them, as they walked by, said, I believe it says that Sunday is the Sabbath. And they kept walking by. A few moments later, a couple passed and said, in my Bible study, and they passed by. And so it, it struck me, as I've always been aware, especially in this country, that there is something pulsating beneath the surface. It's as if we, we understand in part that isn't there a God? I, I think there is a God. Isn't the Bible somehow important? I, I think it is. I don't read it, but I think it's important. Uh, isn't that, built, that church, aren't we somehow connected to it? But but I'm not a member of it, I'm not part of it. And so it appears to me that you and I are living with the benefits of the reason that we see all these different institutions. We see churches on hillsides, on Main Street. We see universities. We are focused on making sure that we get a good education. There's businesses where we're seeking to find out what others need and seeing if we can provide it. This is on the surface. But there is, I believe, a reason behind or beneath all that we can see. And that we are currently living in a window of time where we're wondering what is going to happen with the things that we can see? What's going to happen with education, with businesses, with employment? Throughout the week, I'm talking with all types of people, working, typical response I hear, is, uh, well, maybe as much as a half of our employees haven't come back to work. Or I drive through the Princeton train station and I still see no cars. And then I hear about the concern of people who live in New York City, 
who are starting to exit for one reason or another. And I ask, what, what is going to happen on the surface? I'm fully confident that God will bring about changes in all of our lives. But it's important for us to realize there is something beneath what we can see. And we have been the recipients of a very firm foundation. Now, I do not believe that this nation was ever declared to be a Christian nation. As a matter of fact, there is uh, no evidence uh, legislatively that that ever occurred. However, there were underneath the founding principles, a very firm foundation, an assumption that was laid that currently, I believe, is in great threat. The first act of the Constitutional Convention. Now, why is the Constitutional Convention important? Well, that occurs after the Declaration of Independence. If you're following at all in the news uh, the statements that are being used, we the people, equal, under God, we hear these phrases being thrown at us. For many, they're totally out of context. We don't understand exactly what that document was about uh, or its purpose. But we do know that they were important. That declaration was important, and the Constitution is important. Right now, you're hearing debate over should we abandon, as it were, certain principles that were foundational in the formation of this country. Those principles are coming out of just a handful of documents. One of them is the Constitution. What was the first act after the Constitution was approved? After the Declaration of Independence, the president of the Continental Congress was a man named Elias Boudinot. Boudinot. Does it ring a bell? There's a street in Princeton named Boudinot. Who was Boudinot? Well, he was the first president of the Constitutional Convention. And what was the first act that was passed by that convention? I quote, whereas in 1777, Congress facing a national shortage of Fill out the blank. Bibles. For our fill in the blank. Schools. The first act of the Constitutional Convention. Whereas there is a national shortage of Bibles for our schools, families, and public worship of God in our churches, we desire to have a Bible printed under our care and encouragement, and therefore order 20,000 copies of the Bible to be imported into the different parts of the states. Now, Boudinot was the president of the Constitutional Convention. 
But he says that there was a title that was far more important to him than that. Boudinot was the founder of the American Bible Society and its first president. And so in 1782, Congress had those Bibles printed and distributed. With the endorsement, we recommend this edition of the Bible to the inhabitants of the United States. We're all familiar with George Washington being sworn in as the first president of the United States. He was sworn in on a Bible which still exists. It was the beginning of a tradition. No one had ever done it before. Upon what am I going to promise? And it was his hand placed on the scripture to which unscripted he replied a statement which we have heard from every president since so help me god now washington served as the commander during the revolution he learned a great deal about overseeing the military uh, trying to find resources the nature of soldiers. He then served two terms as president. They wanted him to serve a third term. He refused. He wanted there to be a limit of his term. One of the most famous documents that has ever been part of American history is the farewell speech given on September 19, 1796. Among other things, Washington encouraged to avoid as much as possible foreign entanglements. He was suspicious of profiteering from war. But there was one area that he was most concerned with, quote, it is impossible to govern the world without God and the Bible. Of all the dispositions of habits that lead to political prosperity, <clears throat> our religion and morality are indispensable. Let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that our national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. Second principle, the president of the United States was John Adams. He served as the president, second president, of the American Bible Society. In an address to the military, to soldiers, he said, we have no government armed with the power capable of contending with human passion, unbridled by morality and true religion. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. James Madison was the father of the Constitution. He said this, we have staked the future of all our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government. According to the Ten Commandments of God. Thomas Jefferson, whose monument was desecrated recently, who is continually uh, thrown into confusion as to what did he believe, what did he didn't believe, was he a deist, was he a Christian, was he merely a philosopher? 
<coughs> Jefferson said this, God who gave us life gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. John Quincy Adams was the son of the second president, John Adams. He will serve as the sixth president of the United States. He will also serve as the president of the American Bible Society, which he considered his highest and most important role. On July 4th, 1821, he said, the highest glory of the American Revolution may be this. It connected in one indissoluble bond the principles of civil government and the principles of Christianity. Calvin Coolidge, the 30th president, made similar statements. Andrew Jackson, whose name today has become quite controversial. His face is on the $20 bill. He said, the Bible is the rock upon our republic rests. Abraham Lincoln declared, the Bible is the best gift God has given to men, but for it, we could not know right from wrong. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven, but we have forgotten God. We have vainly imagined that all these blessings are produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. I could quote President McKinley, Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Herbert Hoover said, American life is built and can alone survive upon the fundamental philosophy announced by the Savior 19 centuries ago. Similar comments, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy. Ronald Reagan said, of the many influences that have shaped the United States into a distinctive nation and people, none may be said to be more fundamental and enduring than the Bible. It was during his term, the year 1983, Congress passed that the year should be celebrated as the year of the Bible. We go all the way back, all the way back to the beginnings of education. 1782, the resolution to print 20,000 Bibles. At the same time, public schools were happening throughout the country and the expansion of the country. What was used for the syllabus was William Holmes McGuffey Reader. It was used for over 100 years. Over 125 million copies were sold. It was stopped as a curriculum in the United States in 1963, an important year. I'll explain in a moment. Lincoln called the McGuffey Reader the schoolmaster of the nation. I remember as a kid on the wall of all my public school classes, the Ten Commandments. I remember learning 
my A, B, C's printed in cursive around the classroom. McGuffey taught A, B, C's. A, in Adam's fall, we sinned all. What type of conversation do you think that caused among the kids? Who is Adam? What is sin? All of us? Of the first 108 universities founded in America, 106 were distinctly Christian. Even Penn State, Penn State, which was originally founded by a building constructed by Benjamin Franklin for the revivals that occurred in Philadelphia. That building became the first building of the University of Pennsylvania. 1636, the original Harvard student handbook Rule number one was that students seeking entrance must know Latin and Greek. Why? So that they could study the Old Testament and the New Testament in their original language. Let every student, according to that handbook, be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and the studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. And then they quote John 17, 3, therefore to lay Jesus Christ as the only foundation of all sound doctrine and knowledge, and seeing the Lord alone give wisdom, let everyone seriously set himself by prayer in secret, to seek him. For over a hundred years, 50% of the graduates of Harvard became pastors or missionaries. Princeton University's motto, under the word we prosper. William and Mary, founded in 1693, was founded, quote, for propagating the pure gospel of Christ, our only mediator to the praise and honor of God Almighty. For a brief window, 19 months, the Pony Express was the fastest way to get mail uh, from New York to California with various stops. They could bring a letter in over, just over seven days across the whole state, the whole United States on horseback. A Pony Express rider was issued a horse, a saddle, a bag in which was a water pouch, a revolver, and a Bible. Now, I'm under no illusion that they read the Bible, but there was a statement being made, a purpose behind the purpose. All this started to change a radical change in this nation. 1947, prayer was simply banished from the public school. And there was just one prayer that was the basis of it being banished. It was a rote prayer. It was only two sentences long. Do you want to know what it was? 
Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence on Thee. We beg Thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. Amen. That band, all prayer, that was the prayer that was so disturbing. And then came 1963. The Supreme Court ruled that Bible reading would be outlawed and unconstitutional in public schools. And this is the justification of that case. If portions of the New Testament were read without explanation, they could have psychological harm to our children. It would take a few years later in Stone versus Graham, where the Ten Commandments were removed from the public school. The justification, quote, if the posted copies of the Ten Commandments were to have any effect at all, it would be to induce children to, what? Read them. And if they read them, meditate upon them. Think about it. And perhaps observe them. This is not a permissible objective, close quote. James Madison, the author of the Constitution, said this. We have staked the whole future of our new nation, not upon the power of the government, far from it. We have staked the future of all our political constitutions upon the capacity of each of ourselves to govern ourselves according to the moral principles of the Ten Commandments. I'm interested in what you thought this week of a conversion. Roger Stone. Who is Roger Stone? He is a political hack, friend of presidents for decades, a dirty trickster, a man who, by his own description, uh, is very flawed, and all that's true. But this week, he was interviewed. He was interviewed to talk about his pardon, his suspension, his, he doesn't have to go to jail. He was supposed to be put in jail last Tuesday for committing perjury and other acts. But he was freed by President Trump. Now, all that was fascinating. But what I found more interesting, which I did not know, he said six months ago, I was in total breakdown mode. Everything came undone. I was psychologically a mess. And a friend said to me that Franklin Graham is going to be giving a, a meeting, and I think it'd be good for you to go. He set up a meeting beforehand, and Roger Stone met with Franklin Graham. 
And he asked him, he said, how are you doing? He said, I'm, I, I'm doing terrible. I need your help. To which Graham said, you don't need my help. You need God's help. It was the first time that Roger Stone had even conceived of God, how does he fit into all of this, who is God, and so forth. And Franklin Graham explained to him the love of God through Jesus Christ, who died on a cross, who three days later was risen from the dead, who will forgive you of your sin. If you look closely at television, you will see Franklin Graham give a one-minute commercial that the Graham Association pays for. And what does he do in that minute? He says, this is an anxious time. God has not left you. He will come to you through faith faith in his son who died for your sin, who was raised three days later, who is here right now. He will free you. He will give you redemption. Roger Stone said, <clears throat> everyone can be redeemed. And that is the most important lesson of the Bible. It's not that we would simply memorize the Bible or be able to say, oh, I've read the Bible all the way through. All of that's meaningless unless we come to know the love of God, which is the message of redemption. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the good news of the gospel, we thank you that you care for us, that we can trust you, that in the midst of all these changes, that you never change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Watch over each one of us, that we might know you and live by faith. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace. The Lord, the Lord make, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and be gracious. The Lord be gracious, gracious unto you. Amen. 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 this place, we go into a world uh, filled with confusion, conflict, uncertainty, anxiety. That's not why God created you. That's not why Jesus Christ came. He came to fill you with faith, with the trust that all things are well with your soul. And so as we leave this place, we're reminded of the promise of Jesus. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Go joyfully in Jesus' name. Amen.